right. Well, I think we'll get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome again. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the Chelmsford Reference Librarians here at the library. Um, so tonight, thank you all for joining us for another Art on Thursdays. Tonight, we're presenting a program called Seaside Escapes, the Art and Architecture of the New England Coast. And we're joined tonight by Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious. Just to introduce the program, um, from artist colonies to robber baron summer cottages, the New England shoreline has inspired countless creative works. This program looks at seascapes by beloved American artists, including Winslow Homer and Edward Hopper, as well as the over-the-top elegance of Newport, Rhode Island summer homes designed for the titans of industry in the 19th century. Gloucester's eccentric summer retreat, Viewport, is also featured. So now to introduce Jane. Uh, Jane O'Neill is the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. She curates and delivers programs throughout New England and beyond. O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from Harvard University. Born and raised in New Hampshire, she has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at Southern New Hampshire University. So for more information on Jane and her work, please visit imculturallycurious.com. Before we get started, also just another note, um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat down below or in the Q&A section as well in that menu. Um, Jane, as you're going through the presentation, might answer some of those questions and especially at the very end. So just hang on tight for those. So now I'll hand it over to Jane. Thank you so much, Gianna, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about this really fun topic. I feel like this is one of my lighter programs, so it's just perfect for the summer and the end of the summer in particular, especially as you're thinking about like just getting the absolute most out of these last few warm days. There's a lot of inspiration in this program for a good uh, road trip. So take note. <laughs> so we will be getting back to this beautiful image on the screen in just a little while, but I wanted to kind of prime the pump for us today and give us a little bit of a, a visual preamble to thinking about images of the seaside, um, not, not just the New England shore, but beyond that. Um, so let's get started with just a quick look at a really a, a realistic, a naturalistic depiction of, of the shoreline. This is a painting by John Frederick Kensett, dates to 1860, and it's actually a view of a beach in Beverly, Massachusetts, so it might be pretty close to a lot of you. And I love this view of the beach because it feels like you could just walk right on. You could join this little picnic here and you know exactly what it would feel like on your feet and in between your toes as you walk across the sand and over to the waterline. It, um, it's, it's an image that's so realistic. It just uh, it immediately transports you there. Now, this next image in my visual preamble for you is, is not about the realism, it is all about the drama. This was painted by a German-American artist named Albert Beardstadt. He did a whole series called Seal Rock in the 1870s. And it's um, almost always these kind of churning waves and really dramatic light like this. I particularly am just, I go gaga over this. The light coming through these cresting waves, giving us that seafoam green, it's just remarkable. I absolutely love it. Now, not all artists are there for the, the visual splendor of crashing waves. We have a painting here by William Glackens, who's mostly interested in how people are using the seaside. So in his view of a beach from New London, uh, I'm assuming this is New London, Connecticut, uh, we see uh, almost no sand. There's so many people and, you know, they're gathering together, they're socializing, they're sunbathing, and then we have just a, a nice Nice, cool, calm sea out beyond that. But it's really about where people are coming together and how this beach in particular is being enjoyed. Now, if you're anything like me, you like a little peace and quiet when you go to the beach. And Charles DeMuth's watercolor here is just 
just that. <laughs> this is called the Provincetown Dunes. It dates to 1914 and it's ethereal. It's otherworldly. You almost feel like you're on the surface of, of another planet when you're looking at this because he's using these incredible colors, the purples, the blues, the reds, the yellows. But at the same time, it still really does feel like like the beach, like the like the ocean. So there's something um, just wonderfully evocative about about this watercolor here. So we'll end our little visual preamble with kind of a visual joke here. This is a painting by the artist Roy Lichtenstein, who is working in the 60s and the 70s in this kind of famous comic book style that he pioneered with the little polka dots and the stripes and that sort of thing. Now, this is a real abstract work for him. Um, he called it the nude on the beach from 1977. And so we have almost the, just the faintest suggestion of, of a female form. Maybe this is her blonde ponytail. And then she's got this kind of blobby body here and she's holding a little shovel. And for some reason, there are these holes in her body very similar to this giant piece of Swiss cheese that also happens to be on the shoreline. Now, um, this, is a, this is a silly look at the beach, of course. Um, but I, I hate to break it to you, this is our only nude for tonight. So drink it in, enjoy. <laughs> this is all we get. Now, let me give you a sense in terms of how we will spend the rest of this hour together. I've broken the program up into three main sections. The first is considering artist colonies, one in particular, and then a few artists that just excelled when it came to creating images of the ocean and the shoreline. And then we'll wrap up with architecture, focusing primarily on some of the summer cottages in Newport, Rhode Island, and the very eccentric home of Beaufort in Gloucester. So I'll be um, noting along the way um, where and how you can access uh, many of these incredible works because many of them are, are, are just close by. Okay. So let's get started thinking about art colonies, the lure of the shore. Now, art colonies in America were particularly popular at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And the thinking was all of these artists who were centered in New York City or in Boston, they wanted to get out of the city during the summer, like us all, right? And so they would find these picturesque spots along the New England coast, gather together, um, inspire each other, challenge each other, share um, innovative ideas and techniques. But it was really the scenery that was the, the, um, uh, the, the main driver for so many of these artist colonies. So you had art, artist colonies way up here in Maine, uh, at Monhegan Island, down in uh, Ogunquit, the North Shore of Boston, um, Cape Ann and, and Gloucester in particular. There was also one in Provincetown way out here at the tip. And then um, down here in Connecticut along the shoreline in um, Long Island Sound, you had Coscob and Old Lyme. And we are going to focus in on the Old Lyme art colony today, which was um, very popular uh, for about two decades, really from the beginning of, of the 20th century and right up to around uh, 1920. And so that art colony really focused around this one individual. And I always love when the stories of women who were kind of working behind the scenes, when those stories get told. So we are looking at a woman named Florence Griswold. She was born in 1850, and this was her home. It was at the time kind of a dilapidated Georgian mansion located in Old Lyme, Connecticut. And so in order to make ends meet, she started renting out rooms at her house, right? Right around the year 1900. And the rooms were just cheap enough and uh, located so close to the ocean that uh, a number of artists from Boston and New York began to spend their summers there. You could stay in a room for a week at just $7 if only those prices stayed the same, right? So Florence Griswold um, wasn't just a landlady. She was really the nucleus for what became this very thriving art colony. And, um, and before I move on, I do just want to say that there is a museum now named after her in Old Lyme, Connecticut called the Florence Griswold Museum. This building, is just part of the museum and it is it's considered sort of the home of American impressionism so I highly recommend visiting at some point soon if you've never been before so thinking about 
Florence Griswold as somebody who was um, encouraging and supporting to these artists. Here is a great example of that. This is a painting by an artist named Willard Metcalf. It's called May Night, and it was painted in 1906. So Willard Metcalf is painting Florence Griswold's home here. He's kind of romanticized it, illuminated it at nightfall. We're under a canopy of stars. And we've got this lovely romanticized uh, woman approaching the front of the house wearing this long dress. And so Willard Metcalf tried to give this painting to Florence Griswold as a form of payment because I guess he was a little bit behind on his rent there and she wouldn't accept it. She said, no, this is the best thing you've ever done. You have to go out and do something with it, enter into a competition or something like that. He did just that. He ended up winning a $1,000 prize. And today this painting is in the National Gallery of Art. So she certainly was playing a role in, um, in the success of these artists. But let's think about these artists coming together, painting together. I always get a kick out of these old photographs from this art colony, just to see how, how prim and proper, how well-dressed they were when they were going out painting. And you can see they're really close clustered together in, in some of these shots. Of course, we've got an individual shot over here too. Um, but it, it reminds us that these artists who were otherwise working in, you know, perhaps solitary studios for much of the year had um, really had some fun being able to, to socialize and, and especially learn from each other as they're working together. Now with the Florence Griswold Museum, Old Line is right on Long Island Sound, but the museum itself is along the Lieutenant River, which is a tidal river emptying out into Long Island Sound. So a lot of these artists stayed close to the house, stayed close to the river. And part of the reason for that was there were a lot more flowers and flowers just lend themselves to impressionism. So we have works here by another one by Willard Metcalf. We have another one here um, by the artist William Robinson. And then over on the right, this lovely work by Clark Voorhees. And you can just see uh, the full expression of American impressionism here. These loose, uh, visible brushstrokes, this broken brushwork. These are artists who are not trying to create a highly detailed painting. They're working outside they're you know working rapidly they have to finish these paintings probably in an afternoon and so flowers and, and foliage that's just the thing but you'll notice in all of these images it's kind of peeking past the flowers to the lovely water just beyond. Now, when these artists were done working at the end of the day, they would head back to Florence Griswold's house. She would serve them dinner out on the piazza. There'd be uh, a table for men, a table for women, uh, mostly because it was, the men were considered uh, kind of so dirty after a day of painting. But if you look at a photograph like this, they all look like bankers to me. They don't look uh, informal or dirty at all. And they also look pretty serious, don't they? I think this photograph sort of lies in some ways because these men were having a great time getting together. They were bo boisterous, they were jovial. And um, and I think that there was quite a bit of um, just, you know, joyful camaraderie that went along with this so much so that the men gave themselves the nickname, the Hot Air Club. So you can just imagine all of the bluster that was happening at that dinner table, even though they look pretty darn serious here. And I should mention too, that the, um, that the president Woodrow Wilson who wasn't president at the time yet. He was the president of Princeton University. He wrote a letter about how he was so looking forward to visiting uh, Florence Griswold's home because this was considered Bohemia. <laughs> I just get such a kick out of that. I mean, the little bow ties and everything, Bohemia, this is it. So one of the things that these artists did as a way of saying thank you, as a way of leaving their mark at Florence Griswold's home was that they would paint a panel inside her dining room. And there are more than 40 of these panels that have been painted by various artists, various themes over the years. And you can go there now and you get like this wonderful cross section of all of these artists that have stayed, that have grown as artists while they were there. And, um, and this sense of contributing back to this community that so much to them. I particularly love this corner over here where we see the beautiful woman with the parasol and the light coming through. Another depiction of the of Florence Griswold's house itself. And then down here, this gorgeous little seascape with um, the Japanese lanterns hanging in the, the these willow branches. It's just 
unbelievably beautiful. Now, I wanted to just cap off our look at this particular artist colony with a look at the painting over the mantle here. It's actually a nine foot long painting by an artist named Henry Rankin Poor, and it was done in 1905, just the first few years of this artist colony. But it's a great way to get a sense of how these artists kind of got along. This, um, this painting is called The Fox Chase, and I'll just give you a few of the details here. Now, if we think of like a fox hunt, we oftentimes think of uh, men on horseback and then a lot of hounds, and then they're chasing after a fox like this. So we see the fox running away, but we don't see men on horseback. We see them running together in a pack, almost as though they are the hounds. This is supposed to be very silly. And, um, and these artists are all identifiable figures who were a part of this artist colony. And it's just a way to show that they're like-minded. They're all heading in the same direction, furiously trying to head in the same direction, maybe capture the prize, which is, you know, success as an artist. But there was a sense that they were in it together, which is so wonderful. Uh, a couple other details from that same long nine foot painting. We have Willard Metcalf working at an easel over here. It almost looks like he's out on the beach, but this is Florence Griswold's house in the background. Notice the bottles of booze in the foreground. And then over here on the left, we have a shirtless uh, artist named Child Hassam, who is painting in the sand. And we'll get to know him a little bit better in just a moment. But for now, we have our, our wonderful sense of what it was like to be an artist visiting an artist colony in the summer in New England. And it sure seems like a nice way to spend a, a few uh, warm months of the year. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to a few artists that will forever be associated with the sea because of the iconic works that they painted. We're going to start off with one of the very best American artists of all time, and that is Winslow Homer. We can see him in a photograph on the left, and then over here on the right is one of his um, most memorable works from the Civil War. He was born, the artist was born in 1836, so he really came of age and kind of cut his teeth as an artist during the Civil War. He was embedded with the Union Army, He's making sketches and then eventually oil paintings like this one. Uh, the Sharpshooter, which was painted in 1863, is in the collection of the Portland Museum of Art in Maine. And this was a particularly terrifying image for the public when they saw it. It was a terrifying idea to, to the artist himself, too, because Prior to the Civil War, I mean, people would just, armies would just line up in battlefields and run at each other and shoot at each other. But this new idea that somebody could be someplace kind of hidden and do something that was considered um, sort of dishonorable, you know, uh, remain hidden and, and, and take someone's life from afar sort of in this undetected, secretive way. So to see this guy perched up here in a tree with a rifle that could eliminate someone's life so easily was something that was uh, particularly harrowing to the artist and to the public at large. Now, after the Civil War, Obviously, Winslow Homer continued to paint, and he created a lot of these uh, beautiful genre scenes of American life. They they all sort of have a little bit of a nostalgic tinge to them. They 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 sort of suggest that you know life was simpler before the Civil War. He gives us a lot of like one room schoolhouses like this, and even though this is an image of children playing, it's a particularly wonderful image from the artist. This one is called Snap the Whip. It's at the Metropolitan. A museum of, of art. These kids are, are sort of playing something almost like Red Rover, but they're kind of, you know, moving their bodies around. We can see the kid at the end has just fallen here. So there is always a sense of quiet to these images. And whenever I look at this, I think, God, the Civil War had cast a very long shadow on the life of Winslow Homer, the things that he saw as a young man. Um, so much so that when he was 47 years old, he moves to Crouts Neck, Maine, and he takes up a uh, residence in a carriage house on a piece of property that had belonged to his family. Here is that carriage house, and here is the main shoreline right here. 
So, um, so it's at this house that he, he sort of converts into a home and studio for himself that he engages with this whole new topic of the sea. It's not pastoral life or, or the war. Now it's just about the ocean. And this is just the perfect place to, to do this work. The house itself has been beautifully restored over the years. You can see that it has a second uh, story porch so that he had uh, this wonderful vantage point for painting the ocean. Here's the view of, from that porch or we get a, a close view of a close sense of what it was like on that porch. And you can go and visit this house yourself if you're so inclined. Go to the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, get your tickets probably well in advance, and they will drive you uh, about a 20 minute drive to go and see this property, which I believe is now a National Historic Landmark. Inside the house, there aren't original works by Winslow Homer, as far as I remember, but, um, but it's more of an opportunity to see how he lived and what his process was like. Now, while he was working there, he cultivated a little bit of a reputation of being a hermit, being a recluse. He didn't want any looky-loos coming to bother him as he's um, cranking out these paintings. So he actually painted a sign for this house that just says snakes, snakes, mice. <laughs> and so that's, I mean, that's warning enough for me. I would have turned away too. And so that's still there. You can still go and see it. So like I said, this is really where uh, the some of the best paintings that he ever made were created. And for the most part, these are images about the awesome power of the sea. And let me tell you, they are some of the most dramatic images. This is like, this is what people did before there was HBO. So this is, uh, and I should mention that these images are like the most sought after images. If you're a curator of American art in any major museum in this country, you want a Homer seascape more than anything. So with this image, which is at the MFA in Boston, it's called Fog Warning from the mid 1880s. And we can see that there's this solitary anonymous fisherman in this little rowboat. He's already done his work. He's he's uh, caught these two giant fish here and he needs to get back to this big boat that is on the horizon. He didn't just row himself out into the middle of the ocean by himself, but there is a fog warning and there's this bank of fog rolling in. Notice how his chin tilts up and it, it just comes over that fog bank. He's really trying to assess can I make it back to that boat in time? This is a life and death moment for the for this uh, fisherman here. Notice how high the waves are. This would be such a physical challenge to try and get back there. And if you get disoriented, what happens to you? I mean, you are lost at sea forever. So it's um, it's quite a quite a dramatic scene. And so for for Homer, he wanted to set up as many of these moments of uh, man versus the awesome power of nature, primarily the sea, as, as possible throughout the 1880s. So this is a work called The Herring Net. It was painted in 1885. This is at the Art Institute of Chicago. And once again, we have these anonymous fishermen uh, and there's heroism, once again, in, in what they're doing because they're out on the high seas. There's more boats now. It's not a worry that they're going to get um, uh, lost or forgotten in, in a fog bank. Here, it's this work that they're doing. They're hauling in this net full of the sparkling herring. There's just a little bit of light filtering down through what otherwise seems like a pretty gray day here. And the detail that I love that always kind of rocks my world is this figure that is cantilevering his body over the side of this rowboat. And so I, I mean, I guess that's what you have to do to haul in these herring, but it's somebody who knows exactly what he needs to do in this moment. If I did that, I can tell you the boat would be capsized. We'd all be lost at sea forever. But um, but these are these are anonymous heroes that that know how to stay in balance with the power of the ocean. Now, this last work from the 1880s that I wanted to show you is like the, the ocean has won at this point. This is called Undertow. It's from 1886. This is at the Clark Art Institute in Western Mass. And here we see two women who have been overcome by the power of the 
by the power of the sea. Um, so they've been just recently rescued by these two men who are kind of holding on to their swimming clothes here. The men are once again anonymous. They're uh, very idealized young men. I, I think I, I read from one art historian who, who kind of referred to them as looking like they were uh, ancient Greek uh, sculptures. You know, their their um, their physical beings looked so perfect here. But it's it's really about these men kind of combating that that strength of the ocean once again. So for Winslow Homer, by the 1990s, he realizes. I don't have to have people in these pictures at all. It's really just about the ocean. And um, and for me, these images are just so main too. You look at an image like this in these rocks, this is a gunquit. This is that whole area there. So um, so next time you're up in um, by the marginal way in a gunquit, or if you're making your way up to Portland, Maine, stop by the cliff house, get a nice uh, beverage while you sit there and you can just see these waves crashing on rocks that look just like this. Now this is a work from the mid 1890s and actually Winslow Homer did paint some figures into this work but apparently even after he sold the painting he decided to paint them out. This is a picture called Nor'easter. It's about the power of the sea. It's about the power of the storm. It's about the wild sea spray here. And, you know, these huge waves. I mean, this is just a wall of waves that's over here on the right side of the picture. So everything about this is, is so, uh, so visually impressive. I mean, you, you practically feel like you're standing on those rocks weathering that storm right there with Winslow Homer. And so he committed himself to creating a number of these wild um, stormy seascapes like this with the waves crashing, crashing on the rocks. This is an image called Weather Beaten from 1894. This is also at the Portland Museum of Art. Um, all of these uh, very recognizable rocks in the foreground. And once again, the crashing waves, you can, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can just transport yourself there. You can smell it. You can you can feel it. Uh, he has captured the ocean in such a powerful way. He sort of mellows out <laughs> by 1900. He gives us uh, Prout's Neck, uh, oh, West Point Prout's Neck. This is from 1900, and it's also at the Clark Art Institute. And so now it's not so much about the churning seas, but, uh, but we still get a, a little bit of this elegant sea spray. It looks like it's been frozen in time, right? It's this gorgeous arabesque here with just a little bit of spray at the top. We have these uh, ribbons, these streaks of, of orange and peach and red in the sky, and everything just seems a little bit more serene here. Uh, even, you know, the glassy water in, in the foreground. So just a really lovely scene. So when it comes to painting the ocean, painting the New England shoreline in particular, I have to say, I think winds so Homer is just the best of the best, but we'll see what Child Hassan can bring to the table. So he's our next artist we're going to consider. He's about a generation younger than Winslow Homer. He was born in 1859. We can see him here in a self-portrait from the early 20th century. He was undisputed, America's greatest impressionist painter. We can see him working in an impressionist style, but perhaps his most famous painting is not quite really impressionist. This is an earlier work from him called The Boston Common at twilight. It's from 1891. And this is at the MFA in Boston. It's actually their best selling postcard too. You can imagine all the tourists just want to take home a little piece of Boston. And this is such a great depiction of it. So, um, so this is a good reminder to us that Child Hassam was one of these artists that was working in cities and then going away for the for the summers. He was a little bit like Marco Polo. He couldn't stay still. So um, first he lived in Boston, later on he lived in New York City, but he would travel far and wide during the summers to find gorgeous locations. He did spend a couple of summers in Old Lyme, Connecticut, hanging around with Florence Griswold, producing these beautiful Impressionist paintings. I mean, it would be, I, I think most people would be hard pressed to differentiate this work from something by Claude Monet, uh, you know, the greatest French Impressionist um, who is working decades before him, but you have uh, this wonderful sense of, of the atmosphere on a sunny, hot day. You have the glittering water here going under the bridge, and, and you just get this, this um, uh, 
remarkable sense of, of what summers look like down in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So for Child Hassam, it wasn't just Florence Griswold who served an important purpose in, in his career. It was another uh, major uh, female figure, and that was Celia Thaxter. Celia Thaxter was a preeminent author at the end of the 19th century, and her family owned property on the Isles of Shoals, this little string of islands just off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. And so this was their, their her, her house there. She actually had to extend this long uh, porch that you can see because she had to extend her own living room. And that's because she was hosting these summer salons there with just the greatest writers from America that you could possibly think of. She had Ralph Waldo Emerson there. She had Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And, you know, I, I mean, just imagine sitting in that room right there. But she also had Child Hassab, and he referred to his time, his summers out on the Isles of Shoals as some of his pleasantest summers and where he met the best people in the country. So Celia Thaxter, in addition to being a writer, she was also a, a gardener. And so she had this famous garden at her house on the Isles of Shoals that was just filled with these poppies. And Child Hassam took full advantage of it. And you can see that it was just a great subject for the full expression of American Impressionism too. So we've got this lovely idealized view of Celia Thaxter standing in the garden. We have all of the stems and the grasses in the foreground and seemingly just resting on top of them at the end of those stems are we, we have um, the explosion of these poppies. So we've got a lot of sort of movement and, and, and chaos in the foreground. And then as we look out beyond, the Atlantic Ocean looks nice and serene and cool with a little sailboat dotting it. So Child Hassam went back to the Isles of Shoals every summer for 30 years. He, I mean, this was a favorite location for him. And we can see um, sometimes he was using oil paint, sometimes he was using uh, watercolors as, as, as we see over here, but this was a constant source of inspiration for him. And like I said, just a great place to exercise this style of impressionism. So just like Winslow Homer's seascapes are just highly sought after works, so are Child Hassam's. In fact, the two works that we're looking at here, which are uh, practically the exact same view, um, this one over on the left is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and this one over on the right is at the National Gallery of Art. So these are really considered the best of the best. I love this because on the left, it just feels like he's sitting down and then he stands up over here on the right. If I was the curator and had to choose between the two of them, I think I'd go for that one on the left. Now, if you're dying to sit among these flowers, you can still travel out to the Isles of Shoals and go and visit Celia Thaxter's garden. I think that sounds pretty darn cool, but I have yet to do it myself. Self. That's on my bucket list. Okay. So just to, to wrap up on Child Hassam, just to give you a sense that it wasn't just Celia Thaxter's garden that he was painting. He went back to just the sea, the shoreline again and again. And just like Claude Monet, who was his idol, his painting uh, mentor in, in, in some ways, he would paint the, the ocean and these seascapes at various times of day, different atmospheres, that sort of thing. So this is in the morning. We've got this beautiful pale pink sky, just a little bit of lavender at the horizon line doesn't the I mean the ocean looks like glass here it's just so quiet so and and you know these beautiful pastels and then just a little bit of movement with these beautiful ribbons of color coming over the rocks in the foreground surprising colors too right there's some fuchsia in there there's some royal blue and some yellows it, I, I think that this is just I mean it's such a sweet picture. It literally feels like candy. So many of his paintings of the ocean feel like candy to me. So here are a few sunsets from Child Hassam, and he's using just this rainbow of colors. He's um, also using uh, these very short broken brushstrokes in order to describe these incredible sunsets too, and the reflections on the water. You can see that uh, that his approach to the Atlantic Ocean is so different from Winslow Homer. Winslow Homer would have had a lot more sea spray and crashing waves in there, but Child Hassam gives us this kind of peaceful view. Okay, the last 
each named artist we're going to be looking at tonight is um, Edward Hopper. We can see him here as a young man over on the left. And he is so closely associated with, um, with working in New York in scenes of urban alienation, like the automat from 1927 that we see on the right. Now, it, this is a funny scene to call uh, call out ur urban alienation because it's just a woman sitting by herself. But because it is in a city setting and because we know it's an automat style restaurant, which means you get all of your food from vending machines, not from wait staff, we know that this is a woman who is out in, um, in a city where she is not connected to anyone else. And there is this sense of of isolation, I, I think sort of reinforced around her. There's like this pyramid of darkness surrounding her as she, um, uh, I think, finishes up this little cup of coffee in the scene. Edward Hopper's probably most famous painting is The Nighthawks from 1942. This is in the um, Chicago Art Institute. And it is, uh, like so many of his works, it's just mysterious enough that it draws us in. Now. Edward Hopper, he was a slow burn when it came to painting. He had a really nice long career, like 60, 70 years, and he only painted like 300 paintings during that time. So it took him a long time. He would get creatively blocked and he would go to the movies. And I always think that Nighthawks is really about that experience of the movies. Um, he sets up this scene in this diner and lets us experience it through this giant plate glass window that functions like a movie screen. And it leaves us wondering and really interested in who these people are, what they're up to in the middle of the night, what these conversations sound like. And we can basically um, play them out in our heads. And, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different for everybody, of course. So Edward Hopper, met his wife, or I should say reconnected with the woman he would marry at the um, artist colony in Gloucester. <laughs> and they lived together in New York City. She was also an artist, but became his model and his archivist. Um, she modeled for the redhead over here in Nighthawks. They were living in a very spare um, fourth floor walk up. They had to share their bathroom with their neighbors. And so just like all these other artists, they just wanted to get out of town when it came to the summer. So they started going to the Cape every year, every summer, beginning in the 1930s. And in 1934, they built this house for themselves in South Truro, Cape Cod. So here's Edward Hopper as a much older man. There's his wife, his wife, Joe, in the background. And there is the ocean. So this is where, I mean, they're just, they are perched right there by the water. And this is where so many of, of his glorious images of summer were, were made. So we have an example of that on the right with this painting called The Groundswell. This was painted in 1939. And there's so much about this that's just stereotypical <laughs> Edward Hopper. So it is just drenched in sunlight. You feel like you are in the middle of a beautiful sunny day. The blues here are just dazzling. And he gives us all of these various shades of blue sort of coming from the horizon line in these waves. But then even in the sky, it transforms uh, and, and sort of modulates as you move up the canvas here too. And then along with those blues and all of that sunlight, we have this group that's out on this rather small sailboat. They don't seem to be interacting. They all seem to kind of be examining this buoy here, maybe thinking about how they move around it. But there is also a quiet to this scene, um, a quiet that's sort of similar to Nighthawks and the Automat that we saw before. So even when it's the most glorious setting imaginable, Edward Hopper leaves the mystery in. All right, he once said, I suppose I'm not very human. All I wanted to do was paint sunlight on the side of a house. And we can see that's exactly what he's doing over here in a painting called Corn Hill um, Truro from 1930. So this is like right when he starts going out to the Cape. And, um, and we can see he's kind of reduced these houses down to their simplest forms, their simplest planes. It's really just about capturing that light there. Edward Hopper also loved the shadows. He had um, sort of a, a made a name for himself by painting pictures in New York City. 
where he was uh, uh, essentially peeking into people's windows. And that's what he was doing in Cape Cod at nighttime too. He would drive around in his car and sometimes just park the car, find an interesting building and paint outside in his car. Um, in this case, we're not peeking into anybody's uh, uh, um, room here in Rooms for Tourists from 1945. Instead, he's giving us the, the facade of this building that seems to have so much character. It seems to have its own face in some ways. And Edward Hopper certainly loved architecture. All right, um, as we go along with his Cape Cod pictures, we have a series here that seems to focus just on you know, that notion of light, uh, sunlight on the side of a house. We have Cape Cod morning, high noon, and then Cape Cod evening. And they weren't painted in this order. They were painted over um, just like more than a decade between some of these works. Uh, but it gives us a sense in terms of how important this subject was to him and how it, it was something he continually revisited. Now, all of these houses look like they could be in the same neighborhood at the very least. They all seem to have this long kind of wheat colored grass in the foreground. But it's, um, it's Edward Hopper's opportunity to examine these shifting effects of light and shadow various times of the day. Um, I love the mystery that he leads in with each of them. Uh, in fact, his wife, Jo, who was serving as his archivist, would write these little descriptions of what he painted just for posterity. And I think her description about this painting on the left was something like, you know, a woman in pink is looking out the window in the morning to assess what the weather is going to be like for the day. And he was like, no, don't do that. I'm not Norman Rockwell. I'm not painting a story here. I'm just sort of like teeing it up. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up a, a story that, that, um, that remains a mystery for the viewer. And I think the mystery uh, is particularly alluring in this image over on the left. We have these three figures, the couple and the dog, and they're, um, it's not even just a lack of interaction, but it's, um, it's it, there's like a heaviness, a tension, to um to their their physical relationships so the dog has been alerted to something outside of the frame uh the couple here doesn't seem to be aware of whatever the dog is looking at instead you imagine that they are having a very difficult conversation they're not really looking at each other her arms are crossed and he seems almost a little distracted once again you can you can sort of draw out so much from just the the few details that the breadcrumbs that, that Edward Hopper gives you. Now, when it comes to Cape Cod, he loved to paint these sailboats. He loved to use these blues, drench his pictures in sunlight. And this painting from 1941 called The Lee Shore, we see just that. There's this wonderful swirl um, created by these moving sailboats here. But we also see something else that is so Hopper. It's this Victorian house that looks like it's built in the water. <laughs> it doesn't even look like it's fully perched on the edge of the landscape here. He creates all of these images. Well, he cre he's created a number of images over the course of his lifetime that, um, that involve a very ambiguous relationship between a, a structure and the water. And perhaps the best known example of that is this picture here called Rooms by the Sea from 1951. This is down at the Yale University Art Gallery. So if you're, if you just have to see it, you already have a few good stops along the way. Now, this is a picture <laughs> that really doesn't make sense when you look at it. We have the open door, we have the beautiful sunlight pouring in, um, creating almost an abstract painting within the painting, the, the realist, realistic painting itself. And then this sense that you could step out into the sun and then potentially step off this ledge right into the ocean. There is no ground beneath you. It just doesn't make sense, especially within the context that there's more of this house or building even beyond this space here. And he gives us another lovely parallelogram of light over here. So um, when it comes to this painting, art historians often talk about how it's both realistic and surrealistic at the same time. There's something almost dreamlike about it. But I think um, the way he's captured 
the light and the immediacy to the water is something that makes it a favorite for so many. Now we'll end with Edward Hopper just by noting the fact that people love their Edward Hopper and they love Edward Hopper in Cape Cod to the extent that this little painting over here, which I don't think is even close to being his best work, recently sold for about $10 million. It's called October in Cape Cod. Um, I guess people will just pay anything to have a little bit of Edward Hopper in their lives. But uh, you don't have to pay, shell out a fortune. You can go and see Edward Hopper at the Cape Ann Museum. There's a really big show there until the middle of October. Um, October. And um, I haven't had the chance to go there yet, but I've been hearing wonderful things about that show. Okay. In our last few moments, we will turn our attention to architecture. We've seen all of these artists who find a way to be by the shoreline, to um, conjure these incredible images of it. Well, what about the architecture? What is getting built along the shoreline? Typically, when we think of, uh, of cottages, of summer homes, of homes by the water, we think of very plain, simple structures, one room shacks, <laughs> um, maybe with a little bit of decoration and ornamentation. If you've ever been to Martha's Vineyard, you probably remember seeing these gingerbread houses out there. Um, but when it comes to the late 19th century in America, Newport, Rhode Island is the place to build your summer home if you are among the wealthiest uh, families in, in the country. So I'm sure everybody who's with us tonight has probably been to Rhode Island before, probably visited Newport. But just as a reminder, it is this little spit of land that's located almost equidistant between New York City and Boston. So you can imagine that all of the leaders of industry are uh, can, can get there pretty easily. It's a mecca for sailing. This is a nice, safe, deep harbor right here. So you can get there fairly easily. And there's a lot of opportunity for building right on the water here. So let's get started looking at, um, at what was built in Newport. And of course, all of the structures I'm going to show you today are owned by the Newport Preservation uh, Society. So they are open to the public and they're such a treat to visit. So one of the first very large summer homes in Newport was built in 1852 for a, a merchant in the old China trade. His name was William Shepherd Wetmore. And this is called Chateau by the or Chateau Sur Mer or the House by the Sea. So uh, this is a very grand kind of Italianate uh, Victorian style home. It was built out of brick and Fall River granite. And it's hard to imagine, but this house that we're looking at here with the towers and the port cochere is actually 37,000 square feet. <laughs> this is an enormous house. And despite its name, it isn't actually on the water in Newport, but it is on this absolutely enormous um, a, a piece of land here. So you can imagine that the owner um, had quite a time people and entertaining people on this large piece of property. Now, towards the end of the 19th century, in this last decade, is really when a lot of the, the building of, I think, a lot of the popular houses uh, to visit in Newport happen. This is called Rosecliff, and this was built for a silver heiress named Teresa Fair Ulrich, and the architects were McKim, Mead, and White. Now, they based this house design on a little outbuilding, a, sort of a minor palace at, um, at the Palace of Versailles in France. So they're working for the silver heiress and they basically give her like Marie Antoinette's house. <laughs> and so we're, we're working in, um, in this neoclassical style. We've got the Ionic columns here. And this is another major, major building. It's 28,000 square feet. There's 30 rooms in this house. And just this section here, this is an H-shaped house. This is the center section. Just this section here is the ballroom. And it was the largest ballroom. It is the largest ballroom in Newport. It measures 40 feet by 80 feet. There's been a number of movies that have been filmed there, including True Lies and the original Great Gatsby. 
And you can just imagine spending your summers in Newport at the end of the 19th century, uh, maybe meeting a, a nice significant other in the, in the ballroom. And then at the end of the night, just walking down that back lawn, right down to the water and breathing in that sort of wonderful mix of, of the uh, of, of the salt in the air. So we can see that this is building on, on a grand scale. These aren't summer cottages anymore. They are opportunities to showcase your wealth. And um, <laughs> and so enter the Vanderbilts, <laughs> not to be outdone, right? So by the time they're building in, in Newport, um, it's generational wealth for the Vanderbilts. This is uh, several generations removed from the, uh, the original um, uh, Commodore Vanderbilt. This is a house called the Marble House that was created for William Vanderbilt. He gave it to his wife, Alva, as a 39th birthday present. We should all be so lucky, right? <laughs> the, uh, the Marble House was really a house that was unparalleled in its opulence for an American home. It has 50 rooms. If it were to go on sale today, it would be well of uh, uh, valued well over $300 billion. It's really just um, so over the top in terms of materials and, and decor. The Vanderbilts imagined it as a temple to the arts in, in the United States, which I think is just so funny because this was their private residence. They weren't going to share it with other people. It was their own private temple to the arts. Inside, <laughs> excuse me, you can see that it is just covered every inch of it in marble in um in fact it's there's 500,000 cubic feet of marble inside the marble house so a lot of, a lot of echo <laughs> not necessarily the warmest place you could ever imagine <clears throat> which is actually quite fitting because William and Alva Vanderbilt got divorced three years after he gave her this house. She kept the house and apparently she didn't use it that often. She would go to Newport quite a bit in the summers, but sort of travel around other circles and really only use the marble house, which we're looking at from the back now. Notice how close it is to the water. Um, she would really only use it to wash her clothes. Apparently it had a wonderful kind of laundry setup at, at the Marble House. So you can think of this house as the most expensive laundromat ever in the history of the world. <laughs> now, um, now, this is another house that's getting even closer to the water here. This is set on about four acres of land. And, um, and another way to access these houses is of course the cliff walk in Newport. So you can walk along this free path and see these houses from a different vantage point. The, um, the Marble House also has this Chinese tea house in the back uh, in in um in the backyard here, and to their credit, they, it was actually used for um, rallies for women's suffrage. So I'm glad that some of that money was spent on a good cause. All right, so the last Newport house that we're going to look at is the granddaddy of them all, the biggest, the best known. Um, this is of course the Breakers. This is more Vanderbilt wealth for you, and this is sort of the direct line from the original Vanderbilt who was making all the money. This is um, a home that was designed for Cornelius Vanderbilt II and his family. It is set on 14 acres of uh, waterfront property. The house itself it takes up an entire acre of land. <laughs> as we get in a little bit closer, oh, I should mention that's Chateau sur Mer in the background. Um, as we get in a little bit closer, you can see that it is also in an Italianate style. It looks like a Renaissance palazzo in some ways. It's got a terracotta roof. Three main stories here and then sort of a secret fourth story for um, primarily for servants and that sort of thing. And um, and this house is, it's just enormous. It's 125,000 square feet. There are 70 rooms at the Breakers. Now that might sound like a lot, but, believe, but unbelievably, the Vanderbilts had a home in New York City that had more than twice that number of rooms. It had 154 rooms. I don't even know what you would do with 154 rooms. So really they were kind of roughing it when they came uh, out to Newport uh, and stayed at the Breakers over the summer. So if you were to go and visit them, let's say you were living at the end of the 19th century and you had all the money in the world and the, the Vanderbilts want you to come and have dinner with them. Well, 
you'd go through this 30 foot high uh, gate. There's also a very tall fence. I think it's about 12 feet tall that wraps around the whole property. If you have this much money, you have to keep out the riffraff. So you go down this long um, drive here and eventually wind up at the Port Cocher. Normally when we think of a big grand house, we think of a big grand entryway, but here it's kind of hidden. And so you would go in through a door over here, travel down a little hallway, and then come into this great central space here. Uh, you'd actually enter in through this curtained archway here. And this central hall, I mean, it rivals any palace in Europe that you've ever been to. There's like these gold cornices, there's pilasters, there's columns. It's just so ornate and so over the top. And if you could drag your eyes away from all of the visual splendor here, you could just walk right across this hall, out this door and onto this terrace and see that breathtaking view. Um, you're so, I, it looks like you're so close to the water, but this is a huge expanse of lawn taking you out there. But it really is just the, it's, it's the sensation. It's like you have it all in this moment. So while you're staying with the, um, with the Vanderbilts, you might get invited over to a party in the music room. I mean, doesn't it feel like you're in Versailles? This is where they would host things like debutante balls in 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 um, in Newport. If you were really cozy <clears throat> with the males in the family, you might even get uh, invited over for a pool game here. Their billiards room is clad in marble mosaics. Unbelievable, just a giant cavernous room here for a pool table but really the um the showstopper in this house is their dining room and this table expands to seat about 40 guests you have crystal chandeliers the just the dining room itself is 2400 square feet so it's bigger than the average american home you also have these gorgeous freestanding rose alabaster columns here and then everything about above it is just covered in gold it is just the most over-the-top setting to have a, have a meal <laughs> but shouldn't we all be so lucky to eat one meal in a place like this now we're going to end in a very humble place <laughs> and that is in the bathroom this is cornelius ii's private bathroom and the only reason i wanted to show it to you is because um we've got a little bit of technology here some innovation that i think is just so fantastic you have a marble tub with a spigot and look there are um there are four different faucets here at, for hot and cold, fresh water and salt water. So the Vanderbilts had really thought of it all and they got it all when they were designing the breakers. So we're going to end tonight with one last house and it is not in Newport. If you're from Massachusetts, it's a little closer to home. This is a house that's known as Beauport or the Sleeper McCann house. It dates to about 1907. So really only about a decade after the Breakers. Now the Breakers was on 14 acres of land. <laughs> Beauport is on less than one acre, but it has 50 rooms. It's more than 14,000 square feet. It was designed by a man who was a professional designer and also a collector of American antiques. And every, every time he found something um, that really he loved or fascinated him, he would just build another room onto his house to showcase um, these objects. He kept building <laughs> onto his house so much so that his neighbors put up like a 14 foot high wall and he built right up to it. Now, this is in a remarkable setting. Beauport is right on the water in Gloucester. This little map here gives you a sense and you kind of have to take a long road out to get to it. I highly recommend stopping by the Beauport Hotel in Gloucester for a nice beverage, um, but the house is a, is a little bit beyond that. Now, it is this... Um, it, it, it's a house that makes you feel like you've gone through the looking glass. It is um, a place where scale and proportion are so distorted. We're looking at the backside of the house now. We're on the water and you can see that Beauport is just right there on the rocks, hanging up those, this ledge uh, right there in, in the Gloucester Harbor. You'll notice it's a it's a stylistic mishmash 
All of these windows are things that he salvaged from other properties and once again, just built new rooms onto his own property. So let's go inside and get a sense in terms of what he was all about. Now, Henry Davis Sleeper was um, a very influential designer at the beginning of the 20th century. And so he would do things here and other, um, uh, well, significant homeowners, the DuPonts, for example, in, in Delaware would do, would sort of consult with him and do the same thing at their house. So this is his China trade room inspired by this wallpaper that he found that belonged to an original signer of the Declaration of Independence. So back to that American history piece. And he creates this whole space uh, um, inspired by the colors and the feel of this, of this wallpaper. We are in a little two-story uh, tall room. And when I say little, most of these rooms almost feel like uh, three-quarter scale. Everything is is kind of huddled <laughs> around Beaufort. And some of these rooms would um, would be updated even as the, uh, as the designer was living there. This actually used to be, I think, um, like a, a medieval hall at one point, but he finds the wallpaper and he changes everything. This next room I wanted to show you is called the octagon room. And of course it's in the shape of an octagon. It has an octagonal table at the center. And then all of these little touches of red, the walls are this deep aubergine. So there's this, there's a little game that you can play as you go through a room like this, looking for these accents of red and how playful he is with it. We've got like a red flamingo back here and then how you can find things grouped in, in eights throughout as well. So everything seems so, um, so sort of historically rooted, but then at the same time, really kind of fun and inventive. And he just goes crazy in his colonial kitchen. So you've probably visited historical sites at some point, um, you know, very old houses in New England that look like this. Maybe uh, maybe you saw a house at Old Surbridge Village at some point that sort of had a colonial kitchen that looked like this. Well, they were all inspired by what Henry Davis Sleeper did in his own colonial kitchen. It, as a side note, it's just funny to make a colonial kitchen in a modern house. So he was a collector and he just found all of these things and just kind of placed them all over this big hearth here. And um, and this set the tone for historic houses for quite some time. And it took a long time before historians realized that Henry Davis Sleeper wasn't aiming for authenticity at all. He was just going for something visually interesting. And so a lot of historic houses had to then declutter <laughs> their designs that were inspired by him because people living in colonial times did not have like 20 ladles and like 15 pots like this. It was much more simple much more humble but uh but he throws it all out there for us in in his kitchen now my very favorite room at his house is this uh circular book tower it's two stories tall but once again it's it's kind of humble in its proportions the whole book tower was built around this discovery that he made and it's these curtains that you see here so um just to give you a sense in terms of placement this black chair in the left hand photograph corresponds to this chair over here that we see on the right he found these wooden curtains and he thought I want to build a room around it. So he built not only the rounded Gothic arch windows, but then the whole room that wraps around it as well. So, so playful, so fantastic. As you're moving through this labyrinthine house, you stumble across these displays of colored glass that uh, just stop you in your tracks uh, and also really make you want to start collecting colored glass. His uh, his sense in terms of, of how to display them, and he also has natural light coming through uh, glass behind them. I mean, he's essentially creating these modern stained glass windows and they're just breathtaking. They are, they, they sort of punctuate uh, different hallways in the house. So one of the last spaces we'll look at is the, one of the dining rooms at Beauport. And this one, it, it's, it's all about the sea. It, it, it 
reminds you that you're you're hanging over this ledge in, in Gloucester Harbor. The furniture is painted this uh, beautiful seafoam green. We've got this large model ship in the background. Now, the furniture is also very spindly. It kind of reminds me of early American furniture. It doesn't necessarily look um, too comfortable. This isn't an opulent dining room like we saw at the Breakers, but who among us wouldn't be drawn to this space so that you could sit right here along this counter and have your breakfast or have your dinner just overlooking the water, watching the boats come in and out. I mean, in many ways, what he's done with this dining room is so beyond what they did at, uh, at, at the Breakers in Newport. So I'll end our look at Beauport with just this little room that's upstairs with this incredible window here and how he managed to create this seaside fantasy house that makes you feel so close to the water. In fact, you're so close that it sort of reminds me of Edward Hopper and those buildings that he painted that were a little too close to the water, but um, provide that connection to the ocean that I think so many of us are longing for all summer long. So we will quickly conclude with just a couple of big ideas. We, tonight we've seen tumultuous waves and wild ocean spray, as well as these serene candy colored sunsets. We've seen summer homes, both quaint and palatial. And through it all, we've seen uh, this artists and architects who have been inspired by this irresistible mix of salt and water that beckons us back to the shore every year. So I will end there for now, and I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions that you might have about the works that we looked at tonight. Thanks, Rosamund, for your kind words. Oh, we have somebody with a hand raised. Thanks for raising a hand. I think since we're in webinar mode, I think I might need Gianna to help us out here. Let's see. I might be able to um, <laughs> allow you to talk just a moment here. I think the hand went down. Sorry about that. <laughs> if you want to try it again, I think I know what to do. Okay. Well, not a lot of questions. That's okay. This was, like I said, a little bit of a lighter, more fun kind of uh, program. Next month, we're going to be doing Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, a very different um, feel to it. But let me tell you, by the end, you will be in love with not just Jackson Pollock, but you will be over the moon with Lee Krasner, which is Jackson Pollock's wife. So, um, so that is something to look forward to. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight for another Art on Thursdays program. And of course, thank you, Jane. As always, we love these presentations. And as Jane was just mentioning, please join us next month, the end of September, um, for Jackson Pollock, Lee Krasner, and Abstract Expressionism. Um, and keep an eye out for your email. This has been recorded, so you should receive a recording of this program in your emails at some point, hopefully next week. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks Bye. for coming. Bye. Bye.